I'm really proud to be able to work at a land-grant institution like the University of Nebraska. Uh, really proud to work with Kansas State University scientists, Oklahoma State, Texas A&M. We're talking about land-grant institutions all working together trying to better understand this issue. Uh, it's private land state. You know, you saw in the earlier talks a lot of the things about the historical social barriers, uh, a lot of the consequences and challenges that have uh, faced people in terms of trying to manage for grassland dominance and why it keeps coming back to fire. So, so I'm gonna really talk about something that, uh, that's the accumulation of just about a decade or more of research across all those institutions. And we're compiling it to talk about you know, a new idea that we think is really important to understand what's really happened to the private sector and what's happened with fire management uh, you know, today. So this idea of coerced resilience in fire management, I'm gonna talk about what coercion means. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what resilience means. Resilience is very straightforward. We're talking about how much can we change fire and grasslands and still have grasslands emerge as a dominant vegetation type. Resilience is just how much can you change an ecosystem and it still persists in the face of change. So that's what we're gonna talk about here. Well, coercion is rooted in social power. How much have we forced the system into a set of conditions uh, today versus what occurred for thousands of years in the Great Plains? Uh, that's what is that link of what Sam Fullendorf talked about, of that link of the social conditions and how that influences fire today. We have focused a lot on the kind of biophysical aspects, uh, the climate, the soils, the precipitation, et cetera, the fuel conditions, but it's, the core of this is people. So uh, Bob Hamilton had an over-under on how far it took for, uh, for me to start talking about extreme events and, and fire. Uh, so it didn't hit slide one, so I think uh, he probably lost that bet uh, today. But this is the idea underpinning resilience. The, one of the best quotes that I like, it's a couple decades old, by really the godfather of resilience theory and practice, Buzz Holling, was that here's your golden rule. The golden rule is we need to manage for critical types of variations in our ecosystems if they're going to be resilient to change. Now, if we change that critical range of variability, we are eroding resilience in the system and it makes it more likely to tip into something undesirable. That's the point. Well, how much do we manage for critical ranges of variability in fire? How much have we actually paid attention to that question? I mean, the, the point of policy has been to minimize or eliminate the occurrence of extreme events, to minimize or eliminate that range of variability. We haven't thought about it to a, to a whole degree in terms of how important was that? What is that critical range of variability in grasslands? What are those critical aspects of fire that led grasslands to become dominant? This is all rooted in social power theory. So power is really tied to then, you know, I put that up as a definition. We're talking about the influence of control, uh, you know, threat of force, that kind of influence in order to, to really gain compliance or to control behavior of people. Uh, fire is rooted in social power. So this has been studied since really 1959 by, uh, in social science and political science. Uh, there's a whole body of theory tied to social power theory. So what I'm doing today is I'm gonna show you um, how we've been able to develop models now that can link social power theory to fire and ecological resilience. And I'm just gonna walk through that story of what we now know. So there's five bases for power that was proposed in 1959. These are talked about a little bit more. So this is how you can control behavior in people. A lot of people get really uncomfortable talking about power, uh, but it underpins so much of discussions today. And it's really important with fire because you get down to this one, coercive power. That really describes fire management systems. Coercion is this external force that's applied, uh, this threat of influence um, or negative influences to gain compliance of actors. So the people who manage the Great Plains, this is a private lands uh, biome. They're not at the governance table setting policy and governance. That's dictated downwards from other groups. We don't have this public lands mandated uh, initiative. So private landowners are at that table. This is externally driven of when you can burn and when you cannot. 
Well, that removes and minimizes extreme events, and I'll show you how much. But it changes how fire can function in the system. So as a scientist, I like to study how things change. This is what our policies, how it's changed the functioning of fire in Great Plains grasslands. So let's give you some examples of coercion because it is widely evident. Uh, coercion, one example, uh, is social forcing. So decades of anti-fire messaging that have been uh, propped up by government agencies. Here's one example. Uh, the shameful waste that weakens America, only you can prevent the madness. Of course, there's series and series of posters and propaganda tied to this. Uh, the whole point of this was to gain compliance through social forcing, appealing to cultural ideologies, and actually trying to get compliance of people who are fire managers or who might put fire into the landscape in some way. So this is one example. Now, this might be well intended even, but the point of this, this is an example of social forcing by an external group to gain compliance of people who manage with fire. There's political forcing, and this one is widespread right now. So you can talk about uh, burn bans, where there's government-mandated burn bans during certain conditions. Well, that's political forcing on the actors. It's not you all making that decision, it's forced upon you, and there's a threat of penalty if you're not compliant. There's, uh, if you're talking about bureaucracy or increased pressure or influence to have landowners with increased training requirements and bureaucracy requirements, that's an example of political coercion. If you're talking about this classic cartoon that we've seen for years in different fire groups, uh, where, you know, in this example, uh, Moses is gonna visit the burning bush and uh, not without a permit pal, you know, Getting a permit or denied permits is an example, again, of political forcing. It's an example of coercion. Uh, we could be talking about economic forcing. So another example of coercion. So if a fire uh, set within certain conditions uh, gets away, even if it's you know, something that's important for endangered species, water, et cetera, uh, there's a threat of litigation. Example of economic forcing and coercion. Uh, there's also emotional and physical forcing. That's another one. And Sam Fullendorf promised to lead a uh, pub crawl later where he would actually tell us all sorts of stories associated with this. Uh, if not, Bob Hamilton's got some good ones about Sam. Uh, so we can hit this up and talk about what are the different examples. People here, you've seen it, where like there's derisiveness among your neighbors. So threat like with just emotional uh, feedback, actual threat of like physical harm. Classic deal of what's happened when people are trying to start with fire. All this just plays out in the Great Plains. It's just, examples of coercion in resource management is not common. It's an externally imposed force on the system compared to who's actually managing the land. Uh, that's why this is an important thing to consider. There's a whole list here. Uh, Carissa Wonka is working on a review paper right now uh, where she actually has gone through more of them. So you have a whole list of additional laws that you can see here, uh, including in things like environmental laws, of Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, certain tort laws, air quality acts. See the point? As agencies, we often think of the one that we have. Or as a scientist, if I studied it, I would put one policy or law. But to people who are managing the land, multiple of these are influencing the system. Well, what that does is it just changes the potential for fire to function. So I want to make a really clear point. There's all these layers operating in the system. It's this external forcing, this coercion in the system. Social scientists and political scientists philosophically talk about coercion as the opposite of freedom. So what I'm talking about is what are the effects of restricting freedom of private groups that manage their land on how this system functions? That's the philosophical thing we're talking about. And you can tell why that starts making people uncomfortable real quick. We're talking about people's rights. What is ethical obligation is just for us to understand how that system changed. Because all of these are usually well intended, right? They serve some single purpose that's, that's thought to be important. But we have to question our assumption, is just having any fire on the landscape going to actually maintain grassland? Or did you need some of those events that are being minimized by policy? Can grassland persist into the future under our current level of coerced policy regime? 
That's a really important question, because if not, you start making, well, maybe we need to reimagine the space. How do we have both worlds? How do we have safe fires that actually maintain grassland? Given especially that there's increased knowledge coming out that what we've said are alternatives are actually not meeting our natural resource goals on large landscapes, uh, as Sam talked about earlier. So I'll go through this. How much have we actually changed fire intensity and in policy? This is something that's been poorly looked at over the decades. Uh, we did a review of all the studies in Tallgrass Prairie. Only nine had even measured any aspect of fire behavior, and it's one of the most well-studied fire-dependent ecosystems in the world. Well, what happens if you can actually see, and I'll try and point that, you see that orange bar up there. What we did is we developed a model and we said, what's the theoretical maximum? What's the potential max fire intensity in Tallgrass Prairie? Just how hot could it get? Conservative estimate. And then we impose these policy constraints. How much does it minimize that maximum? Well, it reduces maximum fire intensity by 75%. So everything here in the purple, that's the range of conditions that are allowed and permitted. Well, in the fire science, all of our studies were typically conducted in the purple. So what we know about the ecology of fire in the Great Plains is in the bottom 25% of fire intensity. That's really important because all these previous studies said that there was an irreversible threshold where fire couldn't kill mature cedar trees and therefore grasslands wouldn't emerge if it was flipped to a juniper woodland. That was the hypothesis kind of pre-2010. Now you don't see that in a lot of management recommendations anymore because the science showed, well, wait a minute, that's actually a politically derived threshold. It's not one that's actually real ecologically. It can, fire can move back and forth. It can take a juniper woodland like this and go to a grassland. It just has to operate above those thresholds. So this became really important to just understanding where those policy thresholds act. But what that means is that we're at the bottom 25% of heat allowed. So an important thing to remember. Now we studied this. We actually did the traditional prescribed fires. This is out of even my master's work. This is data, um, an experiment conducted in, at Sonora, Texas. Um, with, uh, so what you can see here is that you, this classical threshold where you, see, you need a certain amount of biomass of grass in order to kill a cedar tree with fire. So that threshold becomes important. So if you have certain trees that have enough grass underneath them, they die. If you don't, trees escape damage and persist. So you get a few trees that die, but pretty much juniper woodland persists with classical fire prescriptions. That purple bar happens to be underneath the threshold that is required to kill mature cedar trees. It can kill small ones, but big ones escape, and it's a policy threshold. If you step outside of that, and you can set up uh, certain fire treatments and certain, uh, in this case, we stepped outside existing policies, and we just looked at, well, let's use and design landscapes to control fires in a different set of conditions. And so we actually did that, and you could see all cedar trees died in this example. Uh, there was no longer a fine fuel load threshold requirement. Uh, yeah, just we removed that threshold by just slightly tweaking the conditions we were burning in and stepping out of the traditional fire prescription norm. And those guidelines have been around since the 1970s, so you can't advance them, right? That's absolute knowledge. Uh, we can't in innovate and advance 1970s guidelines of prescribed fire today. We can innovate all day. We can rethink about how we design prescribed fire treatments and how we do these kind of fires and just tweak the system a little bit. So what we're able to do is uh, quantify, I actually have a video here, but I'm not going to dance around. I'll show it to you if you all are interested of how to do that and what that looks like. But it's kind of like as a scientist studying disease. You don't study a disease and minimize how it functions and then say, hey, society, here's how a disease functions, but we only allowed it to function in the bottom 25%. Like, medicine's not going to be very happy with scientists. We have to understand critical range of variability in how these systems function. That's what we did. So this threshold right here represents that juniper mortality threshold. It's about 140, 160 kilojoules per meter per second. That slightly changes with the height of the tree, pretty much. So this is that threshold that uh, separates out, does a tree, individual tree die with fire or not? If it doesn't, you get juniper woodland still. If it does, grassland emerges in our system. 
So all the blue dots represent traditional fire prescriptions, and you can see just figuring out ways to tweak that system, operate in ways that you can exceed that threshold, and now you're, you're actually uh, talking about a very different outcome. So the point I'm making here is that this is the foundation. We now know this is the critical threshold. If you're operating below this, you think fire can't restore grassland. If you're operating above it, you're like, wow, I have 80 to 100% mortality of juniper trees. So you get a completely different outcome. How has policy changed the number of fires that are then required in the system going forward? Because that becomes really important to understanding this critical range variability. So what I'm gonna show you here is the outcome of that data uh, and that model. And this is a question of how much external force or pressure, how much of that policy is changed where grassland emerges in the system. So this green line represents the golden rule, the critical range of variability that exists. How often do you have to have a fire event that operates above juniper mortality thresholds if you run a model that goes on for hundreds of years? So at the end of this model, do you get grassland or do you get something else? Well, if you in this green line have fires once every 12 years or less between fires, grassland dominates all the time. But look at the grass, look at these double arrows. This means grass trees could coexist in our system if you had the rare, occasional, more extreme event above that threshold, something that is thought to be impossible today. Well, what happens is just that rare extreme event just keeps knocking back juniper trees, but the longer you have between fires, well, it gives juniper trees a new chance to reestablish and grow, right? So you're just seeing that balance playing out here. But look at how long it takes before you get eastern red cedar dominance in a tall grass prairie. We're talking multiple decades, like 40 years between fires before your outcome is always a juniper woodland. And look what our current coercive force does to the system. When we impose policy-based uh, decisions today, it moves this line all the way back to where if you're not having fire every four years or less, you don't get grassland dominance. It changed from four decades to four years or less. We think that's probably one of the most coerced systems in the world. Uh, you're talking about a system that could have a lot of grass in it, and even 50-50 trees, you're talking about a couple decades or more, to now being shifted that much. Notice there's no grass tree co-dominance, which is consistent with what we see in studies. If you pass that, it slowly just eats away. The trees keep escaping the fire trap, so it's slowly moving towards juniper woodland. And that's what we keep seeing people talk about throughout Great Plains states, that they're just slowly escaping. So by the end of the model, you have juniper dominance. Like future generations have juniper dominance. So what it results in is that you just have to burn all the time with low intensity fires. That's the outcome. That's not how the system functioned for thousands of years. This represents how that system functioned for thousands of years. There was, it was a policy free system where the actors and indigenous groups got to make those decisions on their own. So I'm just showing you how the system has rapidly changed over this last hundred years and where we are today. Now, a lot of groups will wait to start fire until they have what's called a, quote, resource problem. Uh, so that might be 40%, 20%. Like, when do you start implementing fires and changing just harvesting grass and doing maximum utilization and harvest use efficiency to actually change and start fighting the brush that's increasing? This is critical. If you wait till you have increasing uh, cedar on your areas, here's 40% here. If you, in, the, in this system, notice the green, it doesn't matter. You always can get some aspect of grassland depending on how often you use it because fires are operating above thresholds. But if you're in the current policy uh, system, you can't if you wait till 40% cover. It's irreversible. You get tree dominance. If you go backwards and you start looking at 20%, well, you can get a little more grass, but you better than keep burning all the time. But it's still, you're gonna have a lot of trees in the system. Only if you're burning at 0% cover before it's there, do you get grassland dominance. So if you wait until you have a few cover of trees in our system with the current policy framework, which minimizes fire intensity to where the heat can't kill a cedar tree, 
You have to implement fire before the trees are there. Or you have to figure out how to push the needle and change the system to slightly tweak the governance structure and operate to where you can have some fires above that mortality threshold. That's happened across Nebraska, Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, of groups trying to figure out, well, how can we do it? And how can we do that safely? So you can see, though, this is the current tension in the system. How is that social policy moved the system so far in one direction that it's changed what is possible for landowners to do with fire on their own land. That's how the system has changed. Now, there's another example. Maybe it's not about fire return interval and fire intensity. Maybe you have those and you're like, well, but good grief, we need to change the size of fires because having fires that are hundreds or thousands of acres, uh, of course, while that would have been considered small over the last thousands of years in our system, Fire management today is often done on 50-acre parcels of land or a couple hundred acres, as shown in the updates. Well, this, I'll use an example from the Les Canyon Rangeland Alliance, which historically is thought to burn like about every, uh, once every eight years is the fire return interval. That means that to match the resource targets in a system with the endangered American bearing beetle for livestock production for important game species like quail, you have to have an eighth of that ecoregion a year that has this type of management. So right now, here's that, uh, that it got cut off a little bit. So that would be if it was historical targets. Every four years is what the system's probably at today. So a fourth of the ecoregion, because the cedar trees are coming in so much quicker than they did historically. They're actually spreading faster and germinating quicker. So right now it's about a 750 acres is their average fires in this Les Canyon Rangeland Alliance group. Uh, every eight years that associate with something like you need 40 fires per year to reach your target. That's what was talked about earlier in that yellow for Florida. We never reached the yellow, right? Same mentality here. But if you change the fire size and a fourth of it's needed, you're talking about 100 or a little more. And let's go to the state average. You need 1,650 burn days. So we just don't, it's well intended, but we just don't think of these important interactions between fire intensity, fire size, fire return interval, the basics of 101 of fire ecology. Those interact, and that's how these systems are managed at large scales. So if you're making any change, even if it's well intended, you're talking about the inability to manage large regions and those regions had grasslands that emerged because of those interactions for thousands of years. Again, this is a major change in how these systems function, and it's no wonder then that the grassland biome is collapsing to woody plant dominance. Uh, we have that ability to track it, and we can see it now. Here's an example for the Les Canyons. If you change any of those factors I talked about, it becomes critical, and again, this is a place where there's an endangered species and where people, uh, this is all a branching. So here's a 330,000 acre ecoregion. Since 2000, you've seen a lot of red. That's where it's increased in cover of uh, tree dominance led by eastern red cedar. Everywhere in green on that map is where it's declined since 2000. Everywhere in yellow is relatively constant. Well, notice that since 2013, of all the major ecoregions with investments for conservation expenditures and cost share for eastern red cedar, notice how it plateaued, it stabilized. That's something we haven't seen when you have a high amount of cedar cover across hundreds of thousands of acres to stabilize a region. That's incredibly difficult. You have to focus on the interactions of those fire regime components and think about like how do you scale these things up? Otherwise you have the nice little prairie gardens that'll be the relics of future generations. Like that's the outcome. Or it's Sam's talk for those of you that missed that. So every other place continuing to increase. So these are, again, eco-region level tre trends. We can track that for multiple places in the Great Plains now and look at how these systems are changing. Are the investments actually meeting certain objectives? Because when I showed this originally, the initial thought was like, wow, the groups are pretty bummed out because they were looking to restore grassland and you don't see a whole lot of green on that map. But then you realize like, Stabilizing a region with fire management is pretty unprecedented in areas where you already have a ton of cedar trees. 
So that really gets down to this important message of like how much that system's changed. Bringing these groups together, I like the football analogy, uh, maybe except for having offense and defense that was talked about with uh, different fire uh, groups in the US. It's more like they're on different teams and they're playing offense and defense on the same team, like it becomes really weird, right? That's coercion. Like the offense and defense, it's like the offense just wants to have turnovers and not block. The defense just wants to give up touchdowns. Nobody wants to really be on the field. Nobody wants to really work as a team on it. Coercion in the system is so strong. When we do that, one of the key messages from social scientists it, on here is that it's one of the least rewarding power uh, tenants. This tactic doesn't work very well, especially in natural resource systems. Just top-down control doesn't lead to effective management and it leads to a lot of resentment. I really think that there's opportunities for groups to provide new leadership given that the systems are changing. If not, it gets forced. We're talking about wildfire suppression not working going into the future. We're talking about new changes in wildfire dynamics water, and you think of Nebraska, what, what a resource and challenge that's going to be. Livestock production and profitability, and I now work in the beef state, is what they say. Threatened endangered species, those are state issues. We've connected it to public school funding. Every sector of society is linked to the loss of grasslands in the Great Plains, and it is fundamentally tied with an inability socially to live and coexist with fire and understand how to do it. We can quantify that today, and we can track the consequences of this and how it's changing. Groups have to start to come together and say, well, given that it's changing, can we provide new leadership and get out in front of it? So some things that have been talked about is actually bringing in environmental governance scholars that specialize in this space. They do a lot of that work internationally with like the Resilience Alliance, where it's like, how can we change up how this governance structure is viewed and how it works? And that's something that kind of a landowner-led discussion in Nebraska with the Nebraska Prescribed Fire Council. But maybe that's actually not sufficient. Maybe it needs to be all these state PBAs. Reimagining like landowner-led, actually providing the leadership to say, let's reimagine how to work together and bring these elements closer. Because you see like what's the critical range is needed is so far apart from the range of conditions where you can actually have grasslands the question of what happens when it's illegal, when it's illegal almost doesn't matter because there's hardly any range of conditions where you get grassland today. That's the outcome of the model. And that's what we see on these landscapes. So that's what I'm kind of challenging the group with is like, could that take that step forward? Because this is the group to do it. It's the landowners that have the ability to provide that leadership. Uh, we can provide the information and are happy to support and tell you how the system's changing. So thanks a lot. Always an honor to come talk with you all. Thank you.